ticket to fly to uh, to Berlin to present uh, on, on this, and I was trying to figure out, you know, uh, partly because I was reared in uh, tradition of a certain kind of liberation theology, I had categories of, you know, one uh, group is aggressors, the other ones are liberators, I don't get, you need to kind of uh, identify clearly who's in the wrong, who's in the, in, in the right, and then to pursue justice, right? And once you put this sort of schema of uh, of um, oppression and liberation onto the, the situation like Yugoslavia, you suddenly realize you know, it just doesn't work. It works if you take a little segment of time and freeze it there, and then you, you see who the aggressor was and who the perpetrator was, and it's clear in that case who it was. Serves for aggressors, Croatians for, uh, serves for aggressors, Croatians for victim, victims, right? But if you extend the period of time a little bit more, if you look more in depth, you suddenly see that this picture is much more complex. And I was trying to force this schema onto the situation, and schema would not, would not work. And that's now a week and a half before I'm supposed to deliver uh, a paper in front of my doctoral supervisor, one of the great theologians of, of the time, Jürgen Moltmann, and all the rest of the Germans who are really kind of looking down there in their long noses about anything that's going on anywhere else in the world of theology because they think that they've invented theology, the mother of theology. Now. <laughs> this is how I felt then. This is, how I felt. <laughs> this is completely not true in reality, right? <laughs> uh, and then it occurred to me to give up on this scheme of oppression and liberation, not to discard it, but to frame it and insert it into something larger. And it occurred to me when I was reading the story of the prodigal son, which is a story of forgiveness, which is a story of the father who goes, at least in his own uh, psychological experience, into far land where the, where the son awaits for him and draws him to come in, transforms himself into something which he was not, into the father of the prodigal son, so that the prodigal son can back and reconcile. That became for me a kind of a key insight into what we need to do in situations of conflict of this sort and the lens you wish to see and the result of the book which uh, I mentioned, the book Exclusion and Embrace. So it's a very much, if you want, an experience of an environment which made me uh, growing up, which, which made me have this gut reaction or unsettled, being unsettled with non-reconciling framework, and then push to see the situation from different uh, different angle and um, work from that perspective. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, there is only one person who is really studied and thought deeply and carefully about this issue of reconciliation on the panel here. And that's the person by that. There's only, there's only, well, only one person here, this, well, no, Ryan has done the work too, oh, okay. uh, who's actually rolled up his sleeves uh, <laughs> and done something about it. So, well, I'm a, so but I, it's not false modesty to say that I have some expertise in something prior to or a problem or obstacle to reconciliation, which is the problem of impunity. But I have had some uh, experience, personal exposure to this larger endeavor, aspiration of reconciliation. Um, and in fact, each one of the areas of injustice that I spoke to that had an impact on my life were definitely context of difficult struggle for reconciliation going to South Africa. And in the mid 80s, in which white South African Christians were definitely seeking reconciliation without a bad name apartheid system. Um, there, there was also this very profound um, sense that also for teaching that I remember from uh, South Africa that reconciliation was not going to be possible at a distance. That reconciliation requires this embrace, right? This is incarnational. <laughs> and 
um, and that again, white South Africans wanted reconciliation, many did, without actually having to get close. And just that that was not possible. Uh, also in, in Rwanda, obviously my experience there was uh, certainly the way in which mass atrocities can overwhelm the capacities for reconciliation. Um, it certainly overwhelm our capacities for justice because what I was sent for afterwards was to try to assist with a process by which the leaders and perpetrators of the genocide would be brought to justice. Um, in fact, of course, there were tens of thousands of people participated in the uh, genocide. You know, so justice system is ever designed to be able to do 800,000 murder investigations to really find guilt and innocence. Uh, so the whole thing was just impossible aspiration. And maybe to um, follow uh, Professor Wolf's um, articulation of things, one could definitely see the way everyone couched their oppression of others in a narrative about their own oppression. The white South Africans, uh, especially Afrikaners, had a narrative about the way they were oppressed and the way that they, if they did not maintain a certain control of the territory, they would be thrown into the sea. Likewise, Hutus in Rwanda would tell a story about the way they suffered under the oppression of the Tutsis. Fascinating event in the Philippines, even after the conflict with the Marcos regime, um, what it was like for a, a society to reconstitute itself when you had people who were taking sides in these matters. Because um, everyone, what I, could, I did see is the way this narrative of having been oppressed allows human beings to deliver themselves over to the tools of violence to the Things they would not otherwise ever do, um, or at least they would not see themselves as having to do. And the way that, the, that uh, very common average people can do this, especially the Rwandan genocide, the investigations that we did just made it so clear that it was just average neighbors who would go and slaughter um, their other neighbors. Uh, and what that pretty much felt like was that um, one day they got to really do what they wanted to do to their to murder them, to steal their land, to kill their cattle, and to rape their uh, women. And, and that was powerfully aided by this narrative and story that it was now time for the Hutu to definitively protect themselves from the Hutu, to get rid of the cockroaches, to regain what was rightly theirs. And the, 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 the power of um, all of that to perpetuate and obstruct reconciliation is that powerful. But also just observe that um, uh, we deal a lot just in our work with these individual <coughs> victims of horrific uh, violence. And um, this idea that reconciliation can, or peace can be sought in a, or achieved in the context of impunity is which there is no accountability. Um, in effect, um, no punishment for wrongs that are done is, is highly problematic. Um, finally, um, one of the most beautiful pieces of mysterious reconciliation of the sort that I've had to observe is we do thousands of cases of child sexual assault. And we therefore have hundreds and hundreds of Babies are born as a result of the rape. And especially in these uh, various cultures, to see a father's reconciliation to a child who is assaulted and loved. And what it takes uh, to be able to find wholeness and peace in the midst of that. Um, your 12 year old daughter has been raped. She now is going to have a baby, and now you must live with that baby in your We see this hundreds of times in the extraordinary um, challenge, but also mysterious love and glory that's manifest in which that uh, reconciliation is actually possible.
hard to figure out what the ask next. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you mentioned the community twice, Terry, and um, I'm curious, since, since you have experience with South Africa, um, my experience in post-conflict uh, situations has managed to do with foreign law. And both of those places, uh, in their different ways, tried to move beyond conflict uh, by, well, in South Africa's case, it was very clearly called amnesty. Uh, I'm curious if you think, you know, what's, what's the difference between amnesty and impunity, if there is one? Uh, what is the role of punishment in reaching towards peace? Uh, yeah, if you could reflect a bit on that. I speak of impunity as the social certainty that you will not be punished for an act of violence. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a social, it's, in that sense, it's a social condition, a general social condition in that sense that you are really quite sure that there will be no consequence for your action. 